Welcome to This Academic Life, episode 14. Hi, my name is Kim Michelle Lewis. I'm an Associate Dean of Research and Professor of Physics. Hi, I'm Pani Anual. I'm an Assistant Professor in Mechanical Engineering. Hi, I'm Lucy Zhang. I'm a Professor in Mechanical Engineering. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to our show today. And we'll be talking about mid-career. Mid-career in academia is typically referred to a stage where a professor has advanced from assistant to associate professor, and also those who have obtained tenure. In most cases, the promotion to associate professor comes with tenure, so these two things most likely overlap. With much emphasis on junior faculty, and also senior faculty who had taken leadership roles in academia, mid-career development is often overlooked. However, in my own personal academic journey, mid-career can be as tough and daunting to walk through as early careers. A mid-career burnout resulting in a career slump can occur to many of us. Unlike other non-academic careers, giving up tenure and restarting an entirely different career path is very unlikely. As hard as we try to avoid admitting or even talking about the struggles and challenges we face as mid-career, the reality is it is very real. And if you experience it, you're not alone. So today we'll be talking about this very specific topic of facing mid-career burnout with Professor Michelle Portman. Professor Portman is an associate professor at Technion Israel Institute of Technology. She will be sharing some of the mid-career challenges that she has faced and is facing right now, and also provide some of her insights on the different ways we can overcome them. Welcome, Michelle. It's so great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, before we get into the specifics of mid-career, could you start by telling us a little bit about your journey on how you got into academia? Yeah, sure. So I would start by saying or describing my beginnings, which were as a young woman, I earned my degree from UC Berkeley in political economy of natural resources. And I wanted to work in environmental protection from the very beginning of my career. I had been an exchange student in Israel during my undergraduate studies. And I came to live here once I finished my degree. And I started working, or I actually went back first to get my master's at the Technion in Haifa in Israel my master's in regional and urban planning with the idea that that would help me get a job working on environmental protection. I had some connections from my professors at Berkeley with professors here in Israel. And so that was like the first start of my journey into academics was getting my master's. Once I'd finished though, I really wanted to work and academia was not even really an option for me. I had no examples in my family and I really, really wanted to to do hands-on stuff. So I started working in my job here in Israel and eventually I found myself at divorced with a small child. I wanted to be closer to family. So I went back to the US and I continued working in my field. I worked probably for around 12 years or so. And while I was working for the state of Massachusetts, I moved back to the Boston area. I would have the opportunity to do a part-time PhD program. And I was working for the state of Massachusetts as a regional planner. And to be honest, it wasn't the most suited job for me, but I was a single mother. And for me, I actually waited until I was remarried till I could take this opportunity for going back to school, even on a part-time basis. And I really got into the studies. And at the same time, as I'd been recently remarried, two months before I started my doctoral degree, I gave birth to my second daughter who was born with many birth defects, and that was a journey in itself and quite challenging. But I really found the academic challenges to be so rewarding and really were, for me, unbelievably helpful in getting through that difficult period of dealing with a lot of birth issues, and it was quite amazing. But once I was doing my PhD, 
it became clear to me that I wanted to at least consider the academic life. And I got a postdoc right away following the completion of my degree. And I published pretty well, was able to get a second postdoc, which happened to be at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. From there, once I got back to Israel, I was offered a position at the Technion, and here I am. That's great. I know that your life journey, at least up to the position that you have now, had appeared in the Working Life column in the Science Magazine. We're going to post that link in the show notes here. I really think that our listeners should take a read of that column. It's very, very inspiring. So with that, can you talk about what stage are you in right now in your academic career? And when did you get tenure? And what is your next goal in your career development? Okay, yes. So I've been at the Technion since 2012. It's almost 10 years. I've been teaching there for exactly 10 years. And I got tenure three years ago. So it did take a while. I think it usually takes around that much time. I'm not quite sure, but it was definitely a lot of work, <laughs> very trying. And I immediately went on a sabbatical when I came back from sabbatical, once I got tenured, so that was three years ago. And when I came back, I was vice dean in my faculty of architecture and town planning, where I got my master's degree, so my alma mater. And it was very challenging coming back at that time with COVID a few months after I got back. First of all, there was getting adjusted to being back. And I also was vice dean of student affairs. And that's dealing with a lot of issues related to students being under pressure and crisis periods, illness, things like this. And COVID started a few months later. So it was a bit tough coming back, getting adjusted to being an associate professor. I think also as you advance, there are more expectations of you. And certainly in terms of service. So that was a bit trying. And I have to say that I agree with what Lucy, how you opened this with saying that there's a lot of emphasis on early career and not enough emphasis, in my opinion, on some of the issues that we face in mid-career. Yeah, absolutely. And all these workshops that we have seen at different conferences or even some of these workshops, we always see the support that all the societies or communities are offering for junior faculty. But mid-career, oftentimes we kind of get into this slump mode where the goals are not very clear ahead of us and the path seems like a little bit of a lot of exploration process. It is difficult to often define a clear target after we pass the tenure stage. Right. I think it's a really a period of reassessment. And I think that not only are there workshops and special supports, but there are also a lot of opportunities that are available for junior faculty with the idea of giving them opportunities to get them up to the level of associate professor, which is great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I'm just saying that we're in a different period as tenure and more advanced professors. And each one of these has their own challenges and opportunities. So Michelle, you mentioned that you got tenure three years ago and now as a mid-career, can you mention some of your current challenges in both your academic career and also in life? So I think doing this reassessment, redefining, changing the emphasis, perhaps for me, it was six years of you know, meeting the certain goals that are very clear as a junior faculty member. And all of a sudden, you know, you have to kind of reassess. I think the most important thing in my experience is how to make the job fit your expectations or your personal preferences. And this takes some thinking and some re-examining and perhaps re-emphasizing certain aspects over others of the job, which is one of the great things about being in this stage of the career. Being mid-career, we have some opportunities. So I would say that for me, the main thing right now is tailoring the job to fit my needs and expectations. And also, I'm really, really interested in making an impact in my field. And this is really, really important to me. And so I'm trying to strategize how the best way to do that would be. And then, of course, at the same time in parallel, you have the life issues, which are different life issues, depending on your age. I mean, I went back to get my doctorate when I was 39. There are certain challenges for different life stages, and those need to be considered as well. For example, the whole issue of being an empty nester or elderly parents. So thank you so much. Based on your experience, what do you think are the main causes of these 
major issues for the mid core years? So I would say that there's the stress or maybe that it's somewhat anticlimactic. <laughs> You've been in stress for so long, we don't know any other way. Perhaps you're at the end of that really tiring period. And look for me, I immediately was able to go on a sabbatical. I wasn't able to go the whole year, but I was able to go for a few months. And that's not always possible, depending on family and life circumstances, et cetera. Then there's the issue, I think, of repetition of tasks. I've been in my position for 10 years and the teaching and the students come and the students go and the projects begin, the projects end. And these are somewhat repetitive tasks. And then, like Lucy said before, the reading goal, in a way, you've reached. And now the long-term goal of full professor, the next stage, right, is very open-ended. It's not as clear, perhaps, as the goal of reaching tenure. And then the increased stresses of family obligations that cause major distractions. My daughter, who's very disabled, she's now living out of the home. And that was a big issue of how we organize ourselves around that. And then getting adjusted to her not being in the home. It's been four years since she's been living outside of our home. So these kinds of things, as I mentioned, elderly parents, my parents passed away in the U.S. within the past five years. So another personal thing. I also think that there's no way to disconnect some of what's going on right now in this period of time in our history from what the COVID. And I think that there's some stress and perhaps unsettled feelings around issues of engagement, the fact that we're distanced from each other. I had actually a lab meeting last Thursday for the first time in person. We had a picnic for my lab group and it was just so wonderful. It was just amazing. It was the first time that I'd seen some of the members of my research group in person like for the first time ever. That's been an issue. And then I think there's also a really big issue. I don't know if it's an issue for everyone, but I went into academics or to research for a very specific purpose because I enjoyed research and I enjoyed writing and I enjoyed grant writing and whatever. And I think as you move on in your career, you have less time for doing the specifics of it. And you often have to find a student who's going to lead the effort or do most of the research and kind of that transition from doing the stuff yourself to managing others who do it takes adjusting to. And I think that there's some loss there to the fact that you're not doing the research that you perhaps went into academics to do from the beginning. There's always the aspect of your jobs. I mentioned before that you like doing more and that you like doing less. And one of the things that I'm not really into, but it's a very important part of being an associate professor is some level of self-promotion, right? You need to get the word out that this is what you're doing. This is what you're working on. You have to have your website updated. And these are somewhat less exciting tasks for me than actually doing the research. Great. How can we be more proactive about moving out of this mid-career burnout? Can you provide a few tips or suggestions? about how one can get out of this mid-career burnout quickly? Sometimes it's not so much a question of getting out of it quickly as much as just accepting it and <laughs> adjusting. Well, I think that that's probably the first step is diagnosing and recognizing that this is something that's very common. And as Lucy said, not something that people often wanted to admit to. And I think it also takes time to assess and think about it. And it's, it's important to remember that change is good. It's expected and it's needed. People grow, people change, and it's a normal and natural part of life, as well as careers. In terms of recognizing this kind of a slump, burnout, crisis even, there are some signs. I, I personally don't feel like I have all of the signs, perhaps some of them, but there's somewhat of a lack of motivation, a sense of discontentment, perhaps emptiness, regret. I have no regrets, but I do know that some people do have regrets in terms of picking this profession as opposed to that profession. And then there are stress-related health issues as well that crop up. That's regarding just kind of the recognizing and diagnosing. Then I think it's really important to look for opportunities to share experiences and participate in professional development workshops. Again, I'm all in favor of having mid-career <laughs> professional workshops. I think that would be a great thing. I haven't seen any and haven't participated in any, but it would be nice. And you need to talk to friends, role models, trusted mentors, perhaps colleagues that are experiencing similar things. By the way, Lucy mentioned the working life 
column in science. That's an amazing column. I just love the stories there, really beyond my own, of course. They're a really inspiring stories and very diverse as well. Not everyone's an academic. Some of these scientists also, they work in professional capacities in other ways. Another tip, this is a really important one, I think. It's to structure the job and position so you are able to enhance and grow in the ways that you personally want to. So for example, I really like mentoring students. I really like the one-on-one -on -one, and I want to do more than that. So in terms of my goals, going back to what you asked before, Tanya, I would say that my goals are the more tangible ones that I can define is growing my lab. And also I've written a book, my expertise is in environmental planning for oceans and coasts. And I have one book out and now I'd like to follow up with the second book. So that's my goal. These are ways to keep yourself motivated is to really hone in on the things that you want to do. And then the fourth thing I would say is to emphasize the joy of the process as opposed to just the endpoints. So that's, again, perhaps focusing on those processes that you are most suited to as much as you can and really enjoy the process, not just the endpoint, not just getting there, not just the outcome. Most of all, last point don't feel guilty or even surprised, perhaps, not having the same passion as you had before at different points in your career, perhaps in the beginning when you first got tenure or you first got on faculty. And these are super high points and there's change. There's different eras within the career path. You're not alone. I think that most people experience ups and downs. Part of the problem is that I feel like I'm surrounded by people who don't understand what I do. As much as you have family members, extended family members, or even friends who just are not in academia and they don't know what you're doing all the time. Like, why are you so busy? Why have you not been around for the last 10 years? I mean, that's one of the nice things about the working life essay even is that from reading it consistently over time, you really get a good sense of what an academic does. And it's not always clear to the general public. That's very true. And I constantly putting ourselves in a more objective view, in looking at ourselves in everything, in holistic view of our career, of our family, and assess often help us to evaluate where we are and everything. Oftentimes we're so into what we're doing now, we lose track. We don't have that long-term vision. Right. Yeah. And that speaks to this whole issue of either being disengaged over time or disengaged from others around us, which could encourage or could bring on these feelings of isolation. Thank you so much, Michelle. I think that you brought up a good point. As an early career, I feel that I guess I'm always overwhelmed that I have to do everything and all of them in the best way, research, teaching, service, and do things that I've been told to do. But it seems that in mid-career, you can be more selective and select things that you enjoy the most. And I like the last point that you mentioned to be true to yourself and just don't feel guilty. <laughs> Because that's an issue for many researchers, regardless what a stage of their career they are. Right. I think one of the great advantages of being in mid-career, if we define it as having been promoted and having received tenure, usually those two come together, right? I think that that's really one of the great advantages. And we can appreciate that we do have some wiggle room. So we have some of our listeners may be junior faculty members. And the question is, can any of those tips be applied to junior faculty to prevent them from experiencing similar challenges related to burnout? Right. Okay. So I'm not hundred percent sure I totally avoided burnout. So. <laughs> but uh, in looking back, I would say be mentally prepared at least for life to happen. There's that saying life happens. So all the above five tips apply to that, but you really need to realize that there's an afterlife right? And after a struggle for tenure period, that may be different and be ready for it. And then I would suggest being to build up and be involved with your academic community. So not just the mentor that you had or your role model necessarily, but this is something that I think my university is really good at supporting the networking, perhaps because we're in Israel and we need connections to the European community and to the U.S., other research communities. So that's really helpful. 
and to develop a support network that you can rely on over the long term. So people that are nearer to you that are similar life stages or similar circumstances in terms of family background, this kind of thing can be helpful to be in touch with friends. I would say that during the tenure seeking period, it's important to not neglect outside interests, which you will have to continue them. It's somewhat of a continuation when you're in the next period. So that's really important. And then lastly, there's the issue of sabbatical. So you do have sabbatical to rejuvenate, to recharge the batteries, so to say. The problem with sabbatical, though, is that it doesn't always come when you need it. It's not necessarily in times with the periods when you might need feeling lack of motivation, et cetera. But what I would suggest about the sabbatical that I could have done better, a better job myself, was to prepare for the period in terms of thinking about what you need, what you'd like to do. Is this going to be an opportunity for actually physically being with those colleagues in your academic community, networking, more networking? Is it going to be more of a rest period, a more of a rethinking period, a period for perhaps writing a book, these kinds of things. And that involves asking a lot of questions about especially when you take your first sabbatical, which is what happened to me just as I got tenure and promotion, is to prepare. I totally agree with this. I also had the sabbatical right after getting tenure. I don't think I planned it very well. I had a great time. I went to Japan and I had a wonderful time and I was productive. But in terms of putting that component into my overall career development, I didn't really put all the pieces together. I didn't plan that to be part of the growth. Life comes at us so fast. Oftentimes, if you don't just pause for a little bit and think about the path ahead of you, you skip a step. You can't go back in time. <laughs> right. That speaks to what Kim actually asked about this issue of junior faculty, because you and I were both junior faculty leading up to the sabbatical. So when we got there, we weren't really prepared. Well, thank you, Michelle, so much. I wish this is a topic that's out there to be discussed when I got my tenure and going through my life challenges during my mid-career development. It was a huge struggle for me personally, and I feel that I still have scars in me because of all the challenges that I've had and the burnout and the lack of motivation because of raising children and, and all that. So it's been very tough for me. All these advices will be very helpful for many of our listeners, including myself. Uh, it really brings back a lot of the struggles that I had and I'm still learning. So I'm sure many of our listeners can greatly benefit from this conversation. Yeah, and I really want to put a plug out there for some mid-career attention in terms of workshops and things like this that could be helpful to us. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this conversation. Find us at thisacademiclife.org or follow us on Facebook. You can listen to our latest episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Google Podcasts. Please rate us. We welcome any feedback or suggestions for future episodes. Join us next time for the good, the bad, and the ugly of this academic life.